boy kidnapping idol is basically what it says on the tin. There is an idol, there is a bit of kidnapping, and that's the plot. The very bad plot. Viewer discretion is advised for basically anything you may find in a One Direction Wattpad fic. You have been warned. B-Boy Kidnap an Idol released in 1989 and was directed by Naoyuki Onda and Kenichi Yatagai, and those names probably sound familiar to you. Yachigai is best known for directing parts of Strike Witches, Megazone 23, Bubblegum Crisis, and recently, Tanakaku Kawaii. While Onda was the animation director for things like Berserk, Psychopaths, Ergo Proxy, and Orimo. And so much more. <laughs> Let's not talk about that one. I... Yeah, it's not, yeah. The anime follows the young idol named Kazuya and is totally straight BFF 5 ever Akihiko as they try to understand their young, budding feelings for each other by doing such heterosexual things such as sleeping naked in the same bed together, having a I wish you were a girl conversation, fighting behind a Denny's parking lot at 12am, and spaghetti. So much spaghetti. These cute-ish moments are juxtaposed by, um, scary cuts to a shadow organization that has their eye set on our rather rambunctious idol as indicated by their super demure dartboard. This totally threatening organization is headed by Ko, who wants to recruit Kazuya to be his personal idol. Yeah, we'll get to that because it does mean exactly what you think it means. And now that we have a general overview out of the way, let's get to the actual <sighs> plot. B-Boy opens up on a live broadcast of Kazuya's latest concert being played in a mysterious dark room, with our villain Ko delivering some much needed exposition about our lead. And why yes, he does look like Marilyn Manson, and allegedly acts like him too. Kazuya is a relatively new idol with a dual persona. He has his more serious charismatic side he uses for his performances, but in actuality, he is a giant brat who needs to be babied 24-7. It is worth noting here that 80s Japan had a huge idol culture that kind of persists to this day. So an idol having two distinct moods and personalities was kind of a big deal back then, especially to diehard gachikoi or serious big name fans like Ko here who obsess over younger idols like Kazuya, who is 15 years old by the way. Just thought I'd let that part sit in now before we get to the rest of it. So for those who don't know what the hell a gachi koi is, it is a fan in love with either a person, place, or character of their fixation. Obsessive fixation. A lot of these guys, as stated before, are bigger fans in fandom and often believe that they have a say in what their oshi, which is their favorite, says and does. They are basically the Japanese equivalent of big name fans in Western fandom spaces who police how others interact with their faves. So essentially, stay on Twitter, or old school homestucks if you're from the Tumblr bygone era like me, or for a more modern specific example, Genshin Twitter. If you know, you know. Gachi are pretty big in idol culture spaces for obvious reasons. Ko is heavily implied to be one of Kazuya's gachikoi, a lot like the girls from the opening. His love is obviously just more twisted. We'll go with twisted, that's algorithm safe to say. Oh, and because there is no other place to really say this, despite Kazuya's idol status being important to the plot, this is technically the only real performance we see throughout the entire OVA. The song that Kazuya sings is Midnight Deja Vu by Hiroyuki Nagashima, who also sang an opening to Orange Road, so you know it's a banger. Okay, tangent over, for now. After Ko's villainous stalker monologue about how he wants beautiful things, we finally get to Kazuya's POV as he is sworn by his fans and we get this moment. <laughs> it's so freaking cheesy, I love it. We are then finally introduced to our due protagonist, Akihiko, who is the mother to Kazuya's brat. And he does not take any of Kazuya's shit. And we, of course, are introduced to Ko's lackeys, who happen to be like five feet away from the two while they're doing their cute coupley, not coupley things. Very good job of dodging suspicion, boys. Very discreet. And that is basically the format of the OVA. Kazuya and Akihiko do something cute, and there is an unserious jump cut to the shadow organization that Ko runs being the worst bad guys ever. So an attempt to not just repeat the plot to you bar for bar, we'll just go over the hits. Like Akihiko having his sexual awakening via Kazuya's kissing him on the cheek and suggestively eating sauceless spaghetti with his bare freaking hands. Thank you. Which is a scene so jaw-dropping, I think it's worth an Oscar nom. Like, buddy, what? And this scene just loops 
like two or three times after this. They really wanted you to know that Akihiko is secretly in love with Kazuya, even if Akihiko himself does not know. Which is then followed by a bizarre scene in which they argue if they should have a sleepover or not. And then after their argument, it hard cuts to them naked in bed together. Like, this is wild, because due to scenes later on that we will get to eventually, they definitely are not together. And if they are, that makes half the OVA's plot make no sense. And if that's the case, then I need to be stopped before I K-hole myself about this yaoi. Oh my god. We also learn, unsurprisingly, that Akihiko is rather overprotective of Kazuya. He forces him to actually eat his damn vegetables, which is a callback to Ko's creepy monologue about how Kazuya doesn't eat his damn vegetables, trips a teacher that is bullying Kazuya, and acts coldly to literally everyone else. But all of this is balanced out by Kazuya's brattiness, genuine comedic moments, and a surprising amount of backbone for a bottom in an 80s yaoi. The two are genuinely a cute couple. The relationship dynamic is a sort of what are we middle ground between friends and lovers, and it's played up rather well. I honestly buy their relationship, especially during scenes like this one, or they are fighting because of what is implied to be Akihiko's internalized homophobia. Like, yes, that scene is cheesy, but at least it gives a good through line of what their dynamic really is. All these moments are great, and it makes me wish we had gotten an anime all about these two. And then I remember the OVA's A-plot, and it makes me take that wish back. Speaking of the A-plot, it decided to grace us with its presence by having a bunch of goons just waiting outside the school gates, and actually making good on the title of the show, and they kidnap that idol, or kidnapping that idol, as it were. Akihiko then decides that this is a good time for him to overcome his internalized homophobia and confess his love. says I love you like making out with your best friend during a hostage situation. <laughs> Maybe romance isn't dead. This is a legitimately good moment in all seriousness and it makes the characters feel so alive and cute. What's that? Ko wanted to kidnap Kazuya because he's attracted to him and he is a raging you know what? Yeah, B-Boy carries on the long and proud tradition of early yaoi works being messy. Back in the day, fandom spaces had a higher tolerance for well, bullshit that would probably put modern fandom types into a coma. Stuff like incest, grooming, age gaps, mpreg, abusive relationship dynamics, or just a regular Tuesday afternoon for most fandom girlies that are from my generation and older. So a lot of older works such as this one present genuinely more troubling subject matters and often so brazenly so that it just becomes downright comical. Which maybe that was the point of the OVA? Though, as you can probably tell by my tone of voice, I'm not so sure by that. But it doesn't excuse these moments just from being kind of creepy. Like when Ko asked Kazuya if he slept with Akihiko before or not. Like, buddy, look, you don't want the answer to that. It's confusing. Take it from me. But this is also an obvious reference to idol culture, specifically Gachikoi's hyperfixating on their Oshi's purity, aka if they had a lover before, they are trash and impure and aren't worthy of their affection. Now, sentiments these days have changed in this regard, thank god. In fact, most people seem rather happy if their faves are in a loving relationship, and very rarely do people have a cow over it. And if they do, they're genuinely seen as the weird ones. At least, that's how it is here in Western fandom spaces. I can't really speak for those in the Japanese sphere. Though, if you do know, let me know in the comments down below. Anyway... While I was tangenting, Akihiko, with the help of Ko's lead goon that actually realized that what his boss is doing is, um, fucked, is able to beat up an entire room of grown-ass men using nothing but a table. We also surmise that Ko isn't just any old perv, he's a serial one that has actually done this to countless other idols over the years, and while this does set up some genuine stakes for our lovebirds, it makes Ko even slimier, to put it lightly, and he's supposed to be a comedic villain, which is why it feels so good when Akihigo comes in and bashes a chair on Ko's head, is what I would say if the animators bothered to, you know, animate that. Instead, we just get this. Yeah. Oh, yeah! But no matter, the two young baby lovers? 
are then able to escape on a motorcycle that the goon from before just so happened to bring for this exact moment, I guess, and then are able to ride away together into the sunset, and they, of course, just stop shy of confessing to each other. Now, wasn't that... something? Despite my sheer exasperation towards the end of the plot summary, this OVA was overall a mixed bag. Granted, a mixed bag with a lot of shit in it, but a mixed bag nonetheless. Kazuya and Akihiko were legitimately delightful to watch at times, though admittedly, they are a touch stereotypical for the genre. Kazuya is obviously more of an immature little bottom gremlin type with a lighter color palette, while Akihiko is tall, broody, mature, and has a darker color scheme and attitude. Some combination of these traits can basically be applied to most yaoi and adjacent MLM romances from the 70s to early 2000s in Japan, like Kaze Taki no Uta, Fake, Junjo Romantica, and most importantly, anything by Clamp. You are bound to find, no matter what Clamp work it is, a male-on-male -male romance with one of them having a lighter color palette and one of them having a darker color palette. Sometimes the lighter color palette is the moody one with the most angst, and sometimes the darker one is the more goofy one, but most of the time, it is the reverse of that. Keep that in mind next time you watch Clamp. So all of this is to say, I think the relationship was cute, because I eat that dynamic up every time, baby. Their VAs were also top tier. Oh, and fun fact, you may have recognized the voices of our two leads. The VA for Kazuya is Nozimo Sasaki, aka Yusuke Yurameshi, and Akihiko is played by Takashi Kusao, who is, oh, I don't know, Trunks from Dragon Ball. This cursed OVA has some of the first voice acting performances of some of the most prolific Japanese VAs in anime history. Utterly wild. Still not as wild as how bad this anime is, but I digress. Obviously, our bad guys here were not so secretly my favorite, least favorite thing about the whole OVA. There's something deeply hilarious about just how bad these guys are at being bad. Like, stalking Kazuya so closely that if this were a comedy anime instead of a drama, they definitely would have been noticed. And Mr. Rider's love over here and the dartboard. Oh my god, the dartboard. It was so grand, in fact, that I want a dartboard with Kazuya's face on it too now. But the obviously should be in jail elephant in the room kind of ruined the vibe for me. Call me a baby if you wish, considering my tangent about how problematic old school yaoi can be. But I think everything about Ko's character is gross and unfunny. Ko reads like a bad boogeyman version of a gay man that was super popular back in the 80s, especially in Japan. His obviously overly feminine demure when compared to others is meant to not only be a gag, but also a shorthand for the audience to know that this guy is evil pathetic, and cannot be treasured around teenage boys. I don't think I need to explain how deeply rooted in homophobia this character is. Actually, now that I say this part out loud in the script, I kind of did. Oh well. But before anyone jumps the gun here, I don't think anyone who worked on this anime was a homophobe for obvious reasons. This is a BL after all. Plus, the director went on to direct other works with queer themes in them, so clearly it's a subject he is interested in and exploring, and I for one think that is a net positive. Also, since we are now talking about the overtly bad things about this OVA, let's talk about the pacing, or lack thereof. You may have noticed that my recounting of major moments in the plot section were kinda choppy, and it's not because I don't know how to summarize things, don't ask my English professors, it's because the pacing of the OVA is just that bad. For reference, B-Boy is 26 minutes and 31 seconds long, which is pretty typical as most OVAs are about 30 minutes to an hour. Do you want to know how many of those 26 minutes and 31 seconds are actually used for the plot? 20 minutes. Wanna know why? Because the last six minutes of this OVA is just straight up credits and reused footage from the opening. That's a fifth of the runtime dedicated to reuse footage and credits. Oh, actually, I am so sorry. I'm wrong. It's actually more like 15. Because another five minutes is dedicated to the whole three musical montages this OVA has, excluding the OP. And all the montages take place at the school for some reason. It's like they were desperately trying to hit that 20 minute mark any way they could. Keeping any sense of cohesion was not in this OVA's to do list. In fact, I don't think it had a to do list at all. It is coasting on vibes alone. But honestly, that's not solely a bad thing. B-Boy, despite its flaws, clearly had a lot of heart and effort put into it. Most OVAs from this time period do. OVAs used to be the stomping ground for basically anything that was experimental that didn't fit into Japanese social norms. So most 70s and 80s OVAs have this fun art house quality to them. So whether good or bad, I can't help but to look at something like B-Boy and admire it despite its flaws. 
I mean, after all, it's basically an indie queer romance flick from the 80s, and that's worth admiring, spaghetti and all. Plus, the head goon is mega hot, and I'm tired of pretending he's not. I mean, look at him. Oh my god. The only thing that kept me engaged outside of the cute little romance. Ah! 